What's on your shoulder, Tommy? Oh, um, I had a spot on there I thought was an infection. So I started treating it like an infection. And I used salt on it and all the stuff you'd use out in the bush. And if I could even use some neoprene, it just kept getting worse. So I went to the emergency center a couple of weeks ago and I thought it was MRSA or some staph infection. It was awful looking. And the lady said, well, you're lucky. It's not. It's only cancer. <laughs> 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 Actually made me laugh. So anyway, it's only cancer, but it's really bad cancer because they scheduled me for an operation as soon as possible. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you it doesn't bother me. Of course it bothers me, but I'm not going to let it bother me. If you understand the difference between the two, then you know me. Otherwise, you don't even know why I'm laughing. <laughs> so anyway. Oh boy, look at this. Chapter 57. Oh, I just got woke up. My, my, my gobby woke me up. <laughs> well, it scared the hell out of me that night. The title of the chapter is Yuck! I smell awful. Eventually, I actually fell asleep. I lay on top of my sleepy bag after chasing Mugabe, feeling fully protected by my newest, very best personal friend. Johannes woke me up. He was whistling at a distance for my new four-legged buddy and also at a goat herders that were still in the basin. There were goats all over the place. He was polite, but he kept a respect, <laughs> respectful distance with my pair of boots dangling by the laces, hooked by one hand, holding it out like this. Sure, sort of hiding it behind him, like he was embarrassed to ask how he got there. I asked him by mouthing words in sign language how I could wash up, and he roared laughing, slapping his thighs at my antics, as I pointed to my backside and held my nose. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> I really had a good time over there. I miss being so free. Pointed in the direction of Paul's crowd. I grabbed my top kit, a towel, a fresh underwear, jeans, a t-shirt, and wandered through the sandy beach toward civilization. About 500 meters later, I saw what he meant. A primitive shower with an enclosed-in reed crowd, obviously built for sissy tourists. Inside was a bucket with holes in the bottom, hooked by a handle to a hemp rope on pulleys and a lever to pull it up once, hoisted high enough that you could stand under it. A fire was burning under a donkey. Now, not a real donkey, dudes, but a donkey is a big 55-gallon drum lying on its side, resting on river stones with a fireplace under it. You build a wood fire, and cold water comes into one side of the drum from a borehole deep in the riverbed. Cold as hell. While the hot water is drained out of the spigot on the other side. Voila! Ingenious, huh? Well, that's called a donkey, and that's how we did hot showers. Anyway, a hot shower. I cannot describe the feeling of cleanliness, or cleanliness after about three buckets full of hot water cooled down by a beautiful shade tree and a light wind blowing against my clean, bare skin. Truly, the best outside shower I ever had. Johannes made me understand that the village ladies would consider it an honor to wash my clothes, and I accepted gratefully. Damn. I turned into a middle-class sissy already and hadn't even been a full day yet. When Andrew and Johannita dropped me off, I gave them all my travel money, but not my in-case money. I'm a subscriber to Adam Smith's philosophy that cash is king and will always be, especially in an emergency, so I have cash hidden somewhere. About $10 American will get you about a week's worth of any personal services you need anywhere in the bush and translate into Namibian money, it was a fortune in the village. I had folded, hand washed, clean clothes delivered to my perfect spot every morning. They were collected every night. I never saw them coming or going. Johannes forbid anyone to bother me at my tree. Notice I made a claim already. I asserted it's my tree. And he accepted the cash after my insistence and his many protests on behalf of the entire village. Honestly, I do not want to write these next words. By noon of the next full day, I got the worst case of personal guilt I have ever experienced. I had no one to speak with, so with no stimulation, my mind kept wandering back to previous audiences 
and personal dramas throughout my life. By night, I realized I had screwed every last one of my friends. I was never honest with anyone. I was never forthright with anyone. I was never fair with anyone. I was a total shit my whole life. It was the most awful day of personal expunging in my entire life, and I just knew it was going to get a lot worse as the days dragged on. I brought some fresh meat and drinkables with me. I had some hot chocolate, some sugar, some coffee, and a few chewies at the tiny market in this tiny village yesterday. Damn, was it only yesterday? Seems like a month ago. I busied myself all day long, improving my territorial defenses around my perfect spot, getting extremely territorial, moving and rolling large sitting rocks around the fire pit and stacking the firewood neatly as I need to do my ritual dance tonight, to dance like a samurai warrior dance around my campfire with sparks blowing in the wind and my sword flashing in the light as the flames went up in a dynamic Japanese warrior, music playing loudly in the background. Hmm, sounds like a plan. As the day progressed, my guilt mounted. I began crying again and again in the pain I had caused all the people in my life. I was exhausted with grief. By dusk, I was prepared for a night of terrors. My four-legged buddy came around at dusk. As I ate, he would not eat food that I offered. He was a proper real dog. No human being sissy stuff for him. No human being sissy stuff would pass his mouth. He hunted his own food. I was so jealous. And envious. I was a full-blown, middle-class sissy, and I started crying again. And I begged him with pleading motions and motions to please come closer and just let me pat his head. And he would have none of it because he was a proper fighting dog, a real warrior. He just sat and watched. Or he went for quiet walks alone when he was bored with me. After I washed my plate and cup and stuff, I built a raging fire, fashioned with a long stick with samurai, as a samurai sword. I stripped bare ass naked, and I began my war dance. Something was missing. Oh yes, the music, huh? Oh well, it worked anyway. I was feeling very tired and sleepy. I put on my sleepy bag under the camel thorn tree, and on the sand near the fire, laid my head on a log, and stared up at the Southern Cross and moaned a bit about what a jerk I was, and I cried myself to sleep. I slept like the dead all night. It was wonderful. I awoke to bird song, refreshed, ready to attack the day. I spoke, Hey, Mugabe, want to explore the veld today? He smiled, he looked at me funny, said, Yes, you big sissy and I'll be trotted back to the village. And I think I have about read enough for tonight, really. I just okay. didn't realize it was going to affect me the way it does. Okay, I think I got some of that out of my system. Boy, I didn't know that was still in there. I have to tell you folks, that day was the end of fear in my life forever. The second and third day were peaceful, contemplative, and full of feelings of gratefulness. It was like being back with Uncle Connie on the other side, but still on my body. 
I began talking out loud to Mugabe as they strolled along casually, hoping to meet up with some elephants. I spoke as if he was with me, or was the closest of my mates. I strolled along courageously down Elephant Walk and the rivet, riverbed toward the Reed Sea, where they went to binge on tall grass and drink cool water. Ooh, rah, did I feel good. Gee, it was great to be alive again, and finally have a real imaginary friend who demanded nothing, asked nothing. Would take nothing. I was willing to give his life for me. I knew this new attitude was a gift to me from my spirit. It's a feeling that I never had to this day even. The rest of the ten days was a piece of cake, except for the caterpillars on the fourth day. <laughs> I awoke with a tickle on my nose. I reached up to scratch and I felt my whole nose moving. I sat up. I was covered from head to toe with black squirmy things. Boy, that got my attention. I didn't sleep under a tree after that. On the fifth day, I hugged a two-inch camel thorn tree for a whole day and reached my final decision to hold to add a second warrior character to my personal code. I chose Jew for gentleness. Added to Bach. It's actually tattooed on my arm, so I cover it by my bandage. Uh, it's Jew for gentleness, uh, which is added to Bach, which is simplicity in my uh, Bushido code. The mental and spiritual trick now was to translate thorniness in others into gentleness in me. I, I don't think I made it yet. Oh well, another day. I do not know which. I stopped counting. I watched the shadow cross a mountain for one whole day without moving from one spot. It required incredible patience and I added a third character to myself, Khan. That's what I have tattooed on my arm, Bakshi Khan. Instinct. I don't do anything unless I have the instinct. I now had all three characteristics necessary to discipline myself, simplicity, gentleness, and instinct. Those words would serve as my personal discipline and living code for the rest of my life. When I arrived in Swaka, I intended to have them tattooed on my upper left arm, the one least likely to be severed in a fight. I was ready for action. Bring it on. Then one day, after I had completely lost track of time, I saw a fancy tourist SUV filling the air with dust, coming down the well-known tourist road toward the entrance of the Rhino Trust Village. I knew I would be on it as soon as it left. I was disappointed and yet happy to leave. For it had been ten days alone, and I loved it. But. These were Europeans, and when they come to see their campsite, they want to know everything about my ten days alone that night sitting around the campfire as my guest rocks and sitting aside along me under my tree. <laughs> they wanted to hear everything this old desert soul had to say about African life in general. I remembered high words about having my own stories. It felt good. I hitched the ride the next day with them all the way back to Swakam. Heim was dead right. I now had my own stories to tell. Next day, hey Andrew, guess what? We're having our final exam for our first cyber university class at the Ukab River Camp. He smiled and just rolled his eyes. I never surprised him. He knew I could come up with some real doozies. And does it seem so weird now that I was so open to get this hitched up to Danielle three weeks later? Hmm, we hear that story. Next chapter is called Chapter 58, The Trek to Ukab. <laughs>